Welcome to the Transform My Dance Studio podcast, powered by the Dance Studio Owners Association. Over the next eight weeks, as we are thrilled to be welcoming the one and only Hilary Parnell as our guest host for a brand new series, Plies to Profits. Hillary is the owner of Academy for the Performing Arts in North Carolina, and this very special series will give you an inside look into how Hillary has grown her dance studio as she shares her tips on building a million dollar dance studio. In this season, Hillary will be diving into how she delegates tasks effectively, her less but better philosophy, how to bring in more revenue with less output, building community in your studio, and so much more. We hope you enjoy Plies to Profits with Hillary Parnell. Hey everyone, I'm Hillary Parnell and I am thrilled to be hosting the next eight episodes of the Transform My Dance Studio podcast. Over the next eight episodes, I will be walking you through the steps to adding lucrative revenue streams to your dance studio without stressing you out or straining your staff or costing you a fortune. We're going to talk about how building a community within your studio will increase retention and ultimately revenue. We'll make a huge list of things studios are doing to bring in non-tuition revenue throughout the year. And I'll introduce several big ideas that you may not have ever even considered before. Although we're going to dive deep into all the different ways you can find more money in your studio in later episodes, this episode is going to be all about getting your studio ready. Since most dance studio owners are super creative people, you probably all have amazing ideas. You've probably had tons of amazing ideas over the years, but when you try to implement them, you can't understand exactly why they don't work. We're going to talk all about that in this episode I'm calling Preparing for Profit to help you prepare your studio for the ideas that we're going to talk about. So not only will they work, but they will work without straining the programs and staff you already have in place. The goal here is going to be growth without the growing pains. But before we get into all of that, I thought I would start by telling you a little bit more about me and how I've become sort of an expert on finding money. My story might be similar to many of yours. I opened my studio when I was 22. I had absolutely no concept of money, how to get it, how to save it, or how any of it worked. I had hardly even ever paid bills on my own. By sheer luck and following my gut, we were able to make it from year to year. Um, But we were always paying off debt and we would go into even more debt every summer. My dad was helping me at the beginning and because I was so clueless. Um, But rather than holding me accountable, and, and making me learn the information, he would just shuffle money around and make it work. Um, and I had absolutely no idea what our numbers looked like. I was completely flying blind and doing okay until one day I wasn't. We were sitting with the accountant and something he said made me realize that if I didn't figure this out, we weren't going to last much longer. So long story short, I took over all the books. I made overly complicated spreadsheets and I just took control of everything. And made more of a mess before things got better. But it was not until then that I finally realized that our monthly tuition wasn't even covering our monthly expenses, which to me was a huge light bulb that I should have figured out many, many years before. Um, I didn't know how we were surviving. How had we made it 10 years? Um, It was absurd. But after doing some digging, I realized what was happening. Um, our big influxes of money that we would bring in for costumes and recital were carrying us from month to month to make up the difference. So that's why I would really feel a pinch in February and in July every year, because that's when the profit from those two events dried up and we would be back to relying solely on tuition. It was then that I realized if that was going to be the case until we had enough students to cover our monthly expenses by tuition only, we had to figure out more ways to get those big influxes of money in throughout the year. So now I'm in year 18. We do cover our monthly expenses with our tuition because we have enough students and all of those new revenue streams that I created along the way to bring in extra money are now just that they're extra, extra revenue that I can use to hire additional staff, make upgrades to our building, or just save. So if your tuition doesn't cover your monthly expenses and you're in the early stages of your studio, having a diverse revenue stream will cover you until you do. 
And if your tuition is covering your monthly expenses, then this is money for summer, for savings, for improvements, or better yet, money in your pocket. So in addition to all the, the financial advantages, adding more services to your business will increase your customer experience and create more loyal customers, which is just a win-win. So let's do some workshopping. I want everyone to come away from this series with some tangible information and action items that you can implement right away. But our first task is to determine what type of studio you are, because for many of you, this may be very obvious, but like me, 10 years in, I still didn't exactly realize this with my numbers. So on a piece of paper, or if you're in your car, just think about it really hard, <laughs> write down your monthly tuition income. Very simple. How much money do you have in the bank on the fifth of each month after all the credit cards have been run? And if you're not already on auto pay, we will talk about that later, but you should be. Then from that number, subtract your average total monthly expenses, including your payroll. So this would be all of your fixed expenses and payroll, your, your rent, your mortgage, your draw or salary, your utilities, plus your payroll. This number is not a line item on your P&L that you get from your accountant, so you have to actually add it to figure it out. So obviously, if your answer is negative, meaning your monthly expenses plus payroll are higher than your tuition that you're bringing in, you need to supplement your studio income with one or more or many of these additional revenue streams that we're going to talk about. If your answer is positive, great, good for you. But just think about how nice it would be to have these influxes of money come in throughout the year that you could save for fun things, bonuses, vacations, staff training, renovations, the list goes on. So, okay, great. I've convinced you that you need to implement new revenue streams, which you probably already knew and didn't need convincing. But before we get started, we need to make sure that you are completely ready to add new things to your business. For years, I would have a crazy idea, like most of us probably have. I would throw it at my staff, implement it a week later, and then wonder why it didn't work. Have you ever had a meeting with your admin staff and you're, you're telling them about something you're super excited about and they kind of look at you with glassy eyes like you're crazy? That happened to me a lot. Um, I would get a great idea or I would hear about a great idea from another awesome studio owner and I'd be like, okay, we're going to do this. It's kind of a tight timeline. I'm going to need everyone to stop what they're doing. We need a flyer. We need a Facebook ad. We need to create the event in Jackrabbit. We need to staff it. And then we would get like two kids to sign up and it would end up being a total bust. So that is no way to run a business. Running a business without a plan is going to burn you out. It's going to frustrate your staff and ultimately it's not going to work. So before you start implement, uh, implementing all of these fun ideas that we're going to talk about over the next several episodes, you have to do some work. I don't want anyone running away and trying to start 10 new side projects because they're all going to be shiny and new and exciting because they'll all probably fail. So how can we avoid this situation? Well, the first and most obvious answer to me is to set a timeline for new things. Now we use Clint's 90-day plan to keep us on track. And if you aren't already a member of the DSOA and using the 90-day plan, I am a huge fan and I encourage you to take the leap. DSOA members use a very specific 90-day plan to help set goals and keep us focused. If you're not, it's fine, but a good rule of thumb for a new event is to give it at least 60 to 90 days to implement. So that means if you get an idea, let's say for a fun holiday event, but it's already November, it's already too late. Save it for next year. That will give you time to really think about it, perfect it, and advertise for it properly to ensure that it's successful. Otherwise, you're really setting yourself up to fail. The next step, and this is a really big one, is to learn how to delegate, and most importantly, how to delegate correctly. I could do a full eight weeks on delegation alone. This is a huge one, so listen up. I find that the people I talk to are in one of two categories when it comes to delegation. One. They don't delegate anything because they're self-proclaimed control freaks and they're afraid that nobody can do it better than them. Or two, they have learned to give people jobs, but they still really feel like nothing can ever get done if they're not micromanaging their team, right? So which one are you? 
do you do everything yourself or do you give people their lists, but you still feel like the building might burn down if you're not around? It's okay. We can fix this. But it's going to not be a really quick fix and it's going to take a little bit of work. But I assure you, once you get your team working with you and not for you, you're going to feel the freedom. You're going to be able to take vacations. You're going to be able to stay home with sick kids. You'll be able to get a haircut or a massage without feeling guilty or nervous about what could happen if you're not there. But I'm sure you're thinking, what does getting massage have to do with new revenue streams? Well, besides the obvious benefits of getting a massage, it is important because you can't be running everything in your studio yourself and start adding new revenue streams. If you're already running on fumes, just getting kids registered and costumes ordered and cleaning bathrooms, how are you going to focus on introducing a new program? And even more so, how are you going to focus on it and make it successful if you're really running on fumes, right? So hopefully you can see where I'm going with this because it can get a little heavy. But after I had this light bulb go off and I made some adjustments, my studio turned a huge corner. Not only did we start bringing in extra revenue, but more importantly, this is where I got my life back. Now, I have four kids between the ages of four and 10. It's super important to me that I have time to spend with them while they are young. I never could have done that if I felt like I couldn't leave the studio. I do teach a little here and there, but mostly I consider teaching my hobby. I work every day on the business from about eight to three, and then I leave and I pick my boys up from school. I can play taxi driver all night, help them with their homework, and even eat a meal with them as a family every once in a while. I completely trust my staff to run the studio all evening. I no longer go to every dance competition or parade or festival. I don't even answer the phone. So let's talk about how to delegate correctly. First of all, I'm going to speak to everyone in that first category of people who are afraid to delegate at all. I get it. You started your studio to do things your way. You tried to delegate before, but you didn't like the outcome, so now you think it's just easier to do it yourself. And although that could sometimes be true, it's definitely not scalable. It's super important to start delegating those minor tasks and then follow up with them until they're done correctly. You have to build a habit first. And although it may take some time up front, you're saving your future self so much time. Think of it as an investment into your future sanity. So here's an example. Years ago, it was the Friday before Memorial Day. This was before I had any sort of branding guide or any procedures manual, way back in those 10 years where I didn't know anything about my money. I simply asked my front desk girl to put a sign on the door that said it would be closed for Memorial Day. She wrote, closed for Memorial Day on a piece of paper and taped it, crooked, to the outside of the glass front door. Now, in my mind, this was wrong on so many levels. It was such a simple task. She managed to mess it up in so many ways, in my opinion. Um, and my first reaction was just to take it down and fix it myself. I'm sure you've been there. But instead, for some reason that day, I said to her, hey, two things. Could you actually type that sign and add the dates and, and then actually make sure you tape it to the inside of the glass door so it doesn't blow away? Cool. She said, no problem. She went to her desk. She typed it, she printed it, she taped it to the inside of the door. Well, this time, I go and look at it, and it was typed in Times New Roman, 12 font, left justified to the top corner of an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper, and taped to the inside of the door, but facing in. At that point, all I could do was laugh. My intention, that seemed very clear in my mind, was to let people know that when they inevitably showed up for class that we were closed. In my mind, this would be a eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper taped to the inside of the glass door with a nice fully justified sign that was clear to read from their car even. When I talked to her again, she was a little confused about why I wanted it on the inside of the door, but didn't even think to tape it facing out so people could read it. Nor did she think to ask me about it before she did it. So the moral of the story, was that it was a prime example of a time where I just wanted to throw up my hands and say, never mind, just let me do it. But for whatever reason, I didn't. I realized how much time I had already spent on it and how my seemingly otherwise competent employee misunderstood my instructions so many ways. So instead, I sat down right then and there and typed up our first procedure for posting things in the studio. It gave instructions, examples, 
approved font choices. I even made a little video. This was my first system. Now we have a full branding guide that everyone in the studio adheres to. But even back then, in its very simplest form, it saved me so much time from that point forward. So if you don't like to delegate, it's actually probably because you haven't communicated enough with your staff. You think they understand something, but they don't because you haven't communicated it clearly to them. So dedicate some time, find it, make it a priority, and just make up some minor task procedures to get yourself started. Train your staff on those and hold them accountable. Minor tasks include things like opening and closing duties, writing a script for answering the phone, how to stock and replenish paper products in the bathrooms, clocking in and out, things like that. Start here, get those jobs sorted out, and then you can apply the more advanced topics we're going to talk about next. So great. We're now at next. You've graduated from the first category, and you do have some procedures in place, which is probably a large portion of the dance studios out there listening today. But you still kind of feel like things are going to fall apart when you're not at the studio. Could you imagine being away for more than a few days? What about a week? What about a month? My goal this summer is to be gone without contact for a full month. And I think it'll be fine. I actually did three weeks last summer uh, with only a few texts, so I think we can do it. But how did I get here? The answer is empowerment. So empowerment is kind of like delegation's big sister. You can delegate to your staff all day long, but what about any issues that fall outside of your procedures manual? There's always something that you haven't already encountered or something that you haven't thought of. And the question is, will your staff make decisions without you? And will they make the same decisions you would make? Here are the steps to get to that point. Step one, the first step in empowering your staff so that you can add revenue streams and truly grow your studio is to make sure your staff understands your why. What drives your decisions? How do you decide what you decide? Especially if you have a staff that hasn't been with you for years and years, you may have a staff member that's been with you for a long time, and you're probably so like-minded that they would naturally do things the way you would. But what about a teacher that you just hired or a front de desk manager that you hired a few weeks ago, right? How do you make sure that they would make the same decisions you would? The best way to do this is to have a rock-solid mission statement. And better yet, have them help you make it. I can honestly say I have never understood the purpose of a mission statement until recently. I've never sat in a restaurant and read the mission statement on the wall or gone to the company's website to see if their values aligned with mine. That's just not something that I would do. But when I started my business, I also didn't understand why this was important. If it's not something I ever paid attention to, why would I need one? Why would anyone else pay attention to it? But now I realize that a mission statement is more valuable internally than externally. When issues come up, if everyone is on board with why you do what you do, they can come to the same conclusions that you would because the answer will become clear based on your values and what is important to you. So if you've made your mission statement and posted it, if you talk about it and you make it part of your culture, it will help allow you to not be at the studio because those decisions will be made without you. This won't happen overnight, but it's a really important step. So the sooner you can get started, the better. Work on that mission statement and have it be part of the conversation you have with your staff often. The second step to empowering your staff is to make sure that they know that they have permission to make decisions. Now, you may think that they know they have permission, but without very specific communication around this, they may be afraid to overstep or be out of line in some way. And you're thinking, why aren't they making any decisions? And they're all feeling like they're being micromanaged. So have the conversation with your staff and give them permission to make decisions. A classic customer service tool that can help with this is something called a lifeboat. It was started, I believe, by Ace Hardware. Um, it's a concept where every employee has a $5 lifeboat. What it means is that every employee is given permission to solve any customer problem without needing manager approval if that problem can be solved for less than $5. It stems from a situation where a customer had an issue about a rebate that was only a couple dollars and it ended up escalating into this huge issue that had to involve upper management. 
And when it all boiled down to it, it could have been dealt with very early on and the customer would have been very happy and saved everyone tons of stress if they just would have given the few dollar rebate from the register in the first place. So now in retail, $5 works well. But for my studio, we actually have a $40 lifeboat. Um, my whole admin staff knows that they don't need my approval or to have any further conversation about it if it's something that they can fix for less than $40. It's the cost of our membership fee. So if someone is upset about something, anything, my staff can apologize and offer up to $40 off next month, off their registration, off costumes, a free DVD, anything to make that parent happy. And it doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it saves time and energy and gives my staff the confidence to make decisions on their own, which is really the most important part. So then the final step to empowering your staff is to make sure that they know that when they do make those decisions, they're not going to get in trouble, even if they're wrong, because there's a learning curve involved. So again, you might think this is obvious. You may never have been mad about anything and you just want them to make decisions, but they still might think it. So it's important to have a system in place for reviewing the decisions your staff makes, talk about how you may or may not have handled it differently, and then make sure that you're not getting upset with your staff if they do make a wrong decision. If they think they're going to get in trouble, the system isn't going to work. Whew. Okay, so we've come full circle. We have determined that if you are covering your monthly expenses with your tuition income, we've talked about the fact that you can't just do every new shiny idea that pops in your head because your staff will think you're crazy. We've discussed how you're not ready to implement new revenue streams in your business until you've empowered your staff. And we've talked a little bit about the process to start getting that to happen. And you're probably thinking, great, let's talk about those revenue streams now. We will, I promise. In later episodes, we will talk all about simple events, more elaborate events, camps, daddy-daughter dances, rentals, birthday parties, after-school programs, how to make the most of your recitals and costume sales, class pictures, DVDs, merchandise, how to make your competitive group your most profitable department, and so much more. But in our very next episode, we're going to talk about one of our favorite DSOA mantras, less is better. Before you can start adding new events, projects, or programs to your studio, it is vital that the ones you have are running smoothly. If you're being pulled in a million directions, each and every one of those programs is going to be strained and you are going to burn out. So next time, we're going to talk all about making your core business as strong as it can be before you add those new programs. We'll discuss some of the most effective systems you should be implementing in your studio and how to create a stellar customer service experience that will keep your students and parents coming back year after year. I'm Hillary, and this has been episode one of the Plies to Profit podcast. See you next time. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Plies to Profits on the Transform My Dance Studio podcast. You can learn more about Hillary, plus the behind the scenes stories from 19 other successful dance studio owners from around the globe in our brand new book, Dance Studio Secrets. 65 Ways to Build a Thriving Studio is now available on Kindle and paperback from Amazon.com. See you next week for a new episode with our special guest host, Hilary Parnell.